Greetings, everybody. This is going to be part three of The Bride of Christ. This is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. When you think about it, you could uh, compare Eve as a type or shadow of Israel leaving her husband. I mean, you know, think about it. Now, if you think that Eve was talking to a snake hanging down from an apple tree, you better check yourself before you wreck yourself. Well, that was a song, right? Yeah, I don't think so. No. Who was, who was the serpent in the garden? Well, that's a simple question. I'll give you a simple answer. And that answer is found in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 9. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent. That old serpent. Why was it called an old serpent? Because that serpent had been around for a long, long time. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, including Eve, right? He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So, instead of Eve listening to her husband, Adam, well, and the Lord, she listened to the serpent. So, in that aspect, I guess you could say that uh, she was like a type or shadow of Israel, rejecting her husband and running after the devil and Satan, the dragon, the serpent, whatever, by whatever name you want to call them. Lucifer, whatever, right? You know, people get carried away. Uh, sometimes they take the Bible literally when it's a figure of speech, and other times they'll, when something's literal, they'll say, well, that's, you know, they'll spiritualize it. But, uh, you know, serpent, it's figure of speech, just like when uh, John the Baptist said, uh, when Jesus appeared at the River Jordan, just before he baptized him, uh, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Now, obviously, Christ was not a four-legged lamb that said, bah! You know, uh, what was that? Uh, well, and then the, uh, the Herodians and the Pharisees said, uh, to Jesus to try to scare him, they said, well, you know, you better, well, I'm paraphrasing, but like, you better run away. Herod's going to kill you. And what did Jesus tell him? He said, tell that fox, Herod. Now, obviously, Herod was not a four-legged dog-like creature. And Jesus was not complimenting Herod on uh, about his good looks, you know, like, you know, guys look at a good-looking girl at the beach and say, wow, look at that fox. No, I don't think so. More like, look, uh, the fox guarding the hen house. That kind of fox with Herod, right? So, all right, well, let's take a look at some things here. Now, please understand the Lord wants a bride without spot, without blemish, a pure, clean, virgin bride. And uh, what are the churches doing to prepare people for this? Well, the 501c3 IRS-approved tax-exempt business corporations that are state-chartered that have the name church in their name 
are doing absolutely virtually nothing to do this. So, all right, we're going to be doing the New Testament with this particular Bible study. All right, so let's go to the book of Matthew, and I guess we're going to go to chapter 3. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now be very careful. There are some people now that are saying that repent just means to change your mind from unbelief to believing in God. You know, repent. Oh yeah, it means to change your mind from unbelief to belief. Well, is that what that means? Well, if you really want to know that repent when it applies to mankind means that he wants us to turn from our wicked ways, turn from our sins, and do good works. And they'll tell you that that's uh, they'll tell you that that's a heresy too. Doing good works is a heresy. They'll say, "Oh well, you're trying to earn your salvation." They call it lordship salvation by being obedient. Um. Uh, yeah. Well, just realize that you're probably speaking with a devil and tell him where to go. But repent. In Revelation chapter 2, Christ told the believing church, a believing church, to repent. For example, in Revelation 2, 5. Now, if you want to read Revelation chapter 2 from verse 1, so you can not say that I'm pulling stuff out of context, feel free to do it. And by the way, if, if please people, if you um, want to follow along with me online, uh, just go to the King James Bible online.org, O-R-G, and uh, pull up these, uh, pull up the chapter and verses that I give you, and you can read along with me. I mean, that's what I do. Um, I'd like to do video editing, but you or uh, and do the screen capture, but you know, there's just some things I'm not that smart on. Plus, you got to realize these hour studies take me sometimes two or more hours to complete an hour study. And if I was doing video editing, it'd probably be three, four, or five hours. You know, so I don't know. My apologies. But but Christ said, Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen. The church had fallen. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works. Or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. So here it is. Christ was telling the believing church to repent. Repent of what? Their unbelief? A believing church, repent of your unbelief? No. When you hear people say that repent means to just believe, you're t either talking to somebody that's extremely ignorant of the scripture or they're deceivers and usually it's the latter but what can i tell you so in those days came john the baptist preaching in the wilderness of judea and saying repent ye for the kingdom of heaven is at hand for this is he christ for this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah. As Isaiah people um, and I just read this from um, part two saying saying the voice of one crying in the wilderness prepare ye the way of the Lord make his path straight and the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins and his meat was locusts and wild honey then went out to him, Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan, 
and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their unbelief? No, confessing their sins. Now, what is baptism? Obviously, doing baptism in the water is a symbolic statement of your faith. But what, is, what does it do? What, is, what does baptism do? It gets your body wet. It's basically an example of washing away the filth of the flesh. Okay? I mean, you think about it. That's basically what it is. It, you know, it, washing away the filth of the flesh. All right, verse 7. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, there's those snakes again, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance, and think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Now people, you don't do good works to get into the kingdom. No. A good tree will produce good fruits. That's how it works. An apple tree produces apples. It doesn't produce apples to become an apple tree. It produces apples because it is an apple tree. And a true believer will have produce good works because they are saved. So, think about that. Now, remember, baptism, water baptism, the washing of the flesh. Verse 11, John says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. So, John is baptizing the filth of the flesh with water, but Christ is going to baptize us in the Spirit with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Now remember, the world's going to be destroyed with fire. Oh yeah. It's going to be burned up, people. Alright, let's go to Second Peter. Now I, I think I did a Bible series on fire. I did some Bible studies on just fire, where I go into detail. But uh, let's go to Second Peter chapter 3. And uh, those that hate Paul will tell you that 2 Peter doesn't belong in the Bible. Oh, they are such experts. They know more than all the people for 1,900 years before them that said uh, 2 Peter belongs in the Bible. But they know more because they're Hebrew roots people. They want to take us back to the roots of the Hebrew, except for they don't want to really take you back to the Hebrew roots. They want to take you away from Jesus. So when you find out who they really are behind, or who's behind them, well, yeah. They've got a Messiah coming. And it's not Jesus. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 1. Oh, and why don't they like 2 Peter? Because he confirms... Paul as a brother in the faith. That's why they don't like Paul and 2 Peter. They don't like 2 Peter because Paul is confirmed 
as a brother in the faith. And you could read the book of Acts. Same thing. These people are devils. That's why the Lord says to um, have the sword, a sort of uh, the sword of faith. I'd like to think that my sword is fairly sharp. Okay, verse one, 2 Peter chapter three, verse one. This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets. Now, if there's holy prophets, that means there's unholy prophets, too. And if you want to see unholy prophets, well, just turn on TBN or 700 Prophets of Baal Club. That ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts, gay marriage anybody? And saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they are willingly ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. Now remember, at the end of the flood, when Noah left the ark, God set a bow, like a bow and arrow, you know, the curve, the rainbow, as a symbol that he would never again destroy the earth with a flood. And of course, what do the Sodomites use for their symbol? The rainbow. It's their way of mocking God, but God's going to have the last laugh. So, whereby the world then was being overflowed with water, perished. Verse 7. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire. Remember, Jesus, uh, John said that Jesus would baptize us with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of un godly men. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. And what do the scoffers do? Well, in Matthew 24, Jesus said that things would shortly come to pass. And everything came to pass in 70 AD. Otherwise, it's not shortly. Well, you know what? If uh, if it was December 23rd and a parent told their kid, well, you know, uh, Christmas is, you know, close. Christmas is close and you're going to get your present. And, and I don't celebrate Christmas, people. So, you know, I'm just, it just popped into my head as an example. You know, a couple days is shortly come to pass. And in the eyes of the Lord, 2,000 years is just a couple of days, okay? To us, yeah, it's a long time, but we're not, the Bible's not looking at things from our perspective. The Bible's looking at things from the Lord's perspective. It's his love letter to us. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You know, I imagine even the Lord would love to see Satan come to repentance, but that ain't going to happen. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. 
the earth also and the works the works that are therein shall be burned up seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness looking for and hastening unto the coming of the day of God wherein the heavens being on fire the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat nevertheless we according to his promise look for new heavens new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness all right oh this is one of paul's epistles first corinthians chapter three. Oh yeah this is that that fake apostle they'll the hebrew roots people will tell you oh yeah paul first corinthians corinth was a city in greece you know, that's another thing. Maybe the Hebrew roots people don't like it because they don't want you to think that the, the Greeks are going to be given salvation. No, no, no. They, they want you to think that only the you-know-whos, the Antichrist, and the Middle East are uh, God's chosen people. Well, they are chosen, but the real question is chosen for what? Personally, I think it's the parable of the wheat and the tares. And God's gathering the tares for the fire. But hey, what you know, what do I know? Do I have a big church like John Hagee? No. I don't have any church. It's just me. So what do I know? First Corinthians chapter three, verse eleven. For other foundation, foundation. Now, what do you do when you're building a house? you got to lay down a foundation. You dig down in the ground deep. And if you can find bedrock, that's great. Because bedrock does not move easily. And then you lay, the, lay down the concrete, right? On top of the, the, the bedrock. For other foundation can no man lay then that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work, every man's work, their deeds, their fruit, every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. That's scary, people. You know, that's not just for the wicked. The wicked are going to have their works burned up, too. But so are the righteous. If, if our, the things that we do in the will of God will remain. Those works that we do in Christ, when they're exposed to fire, they're going to remain. But the works that we did in the flesh that were not in the will of God, they're going to be burned up. So, and let's face it, you know, what is, what's, uh, when you, I don't know how many of you have done a campfire, but I have. You take a big old log and you burn it up. What's left? Ashes ashes that's all that's left and that's what's going to be for a lot of believers that never did anything for christ all their works are going to be basically ashes there's not going to be much left now if any man build upon this foundation gold silver precious stones wood hay stubble every man's work shall be made manifest for the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. So, if the fire doesn't burn up your works, works that were in Christ, 
to his glory and honor and in his will, that which remains, you're going to get a reward for. Verse 15, if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Boy, I'd hate to be somebody who had no works, absolutely nothing. I mean, you know, getting into the kingdom by the skin of your teeth. And believe it or not, that's actually uh, the skin of the skin of your teeth. That's actually a Bible saying. So if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seem, seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool, that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. Yeah, like evolution. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. Vain means worthless. That they are vain. Therefore, let no man glory in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world, or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours, and ye are Christ. And Christ is God's. Now you can read in Matthew 9, or let's see, also uh, Mark chapter 2. Well, let's look at Mark chapter 2. The Pharisees asked, Jesus, why his disciples didn't fast. I think it was, well, I'm kind of guessing here. It could have been the disciples of John. But in uh, Mark 2, 19, And Jesus said unto them, Can the children of the bride chamber fast while the bridegroom is with them? Now Christ is the groom, the bridegroom. As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. But the days will come that the bridegroom shall be taken away from them, and then shall they fast in those days. Now, what happened? Well, when Christ was crucified, he was gone for them from them for three days and three nights. So I'm sure that they were fasting and sorrowful. But then, uh, remember Jesus said that uh, he would go away for a little while and then their sorrow would turn into joy? Well, that's what happened. But this was only speaking about when his mission, when he was here on the earth. And then after he ascended up to heaven, well, then... There's going to be an ultimate fulfillment when he comes back in glory to reclaim his kingdom and the bride. And he wants his bride without a spot, without a blemish. All right, turn to the book of Ephesus, well, Ephesians. Ephesus was a city in Greece. Another one of Paul's writings that they hate. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. Now, the marriage of a man and a woman on earth is sometimes likened unto how the Lord loves his bride, which is Israel. 
And, you know, it just, it kills me that uh, how the uh, churches hide that fact. They absolutely positively do not want us to know that the bride of the Old Testament is the same bride of the New Testament. There's not a Jewish bride and then a Christian bride. No, there's one bride. God is not a polygamist. They're all the same. They're all one in Christ. Contrary to what John Hagee has to say. I don't care what he has to say. I only care what Christ and the apostles have to say. So Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. There's that baptism. Baptism, uh, washing of water by the word. By the scriptures, right? Verse 27. That he might present it to himself. That he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Uh, is the church holy and without blemish? Uh, if you want to call that garbage that they preach on television holy and without blemish, I, I, eesh. and believe me, I, I'm not claiming to be holy and without blemish. No. Verse 28, so men, so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. So Christ wants to present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. That's what Christ is looking for in a church, his bride. He wants a bride. You know, Christ wants a bride and not a harlot. And the harlot is going to be end time Jerusalem, believe it or not. Because let's face it, are they, are they following Christ? No. No, absolutely not. By Bible definition, they are anti-Christ. Now, there will come a time when a remnant of those will acknowledge Christ as the Messiah. But until that time comes, they're blind. Now, what is the definition of an Antichrist? 1 John chapter 2 and verse 22. Who is a liar? But he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ. Is there a group of people that deny that Jesus is the Christ and they look for another Messiah? Yes, there is. Absolutely. And they want to build a temple over in Jerusalem. He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. But he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. You want to know why else they hate Paul? 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 22. Corinth, a city in Greece. If any man love not, if any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema, maranatha. What does anathema means? Cursed. If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema. Let him be cursed. Maranatha. 
Do those that reject Christ, are they blessed or are they cursed? Paul says they're cursed. Are you starting to get the idea why they hate Paul? But, hey, why listen to me? What do I know? All right, let's go to John, the book of John, chapter 2. Now, um, if my memory serves me correctly, this was the beginning of Christ's ministry, and this was the, I think this was the first miracle that he did, uh, the wedding. Now, think about this. There's a wedding on earth. But you could look at this in as a type or shadow of the coming wedding of Christ to his church. You know, there's a parallel there. So let's read John chapter 2, verse 1. And the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. <laughs> you better be called, you better, instead of Jesus being called to your marriage, you better be called to Jesus' marriage. All right, verse 3. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, They have no wine. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. His mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. Oh, if only the Catholics would listen to this. They, you know, they, they honor Mary uh, too much, my opinion. But if only they would listen to Mary and, and, and where she says, whatsoever he, Jesus, saith unto you, do it. Instead of listening to Mary, they ought to be listening to Jesus. But, you know, what can I tell you? Verse 6. And there were set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. Jesus saith unto them, Fill up the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, Draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast. And they bear it. All right, so here it is. They fill up the pots with water. Jesus turns the water into wine. Keep that in mind. Water into wine. All right, let's go to verse, uh, verse 9. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom, and saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. You know, and Baptists will tell you, no, 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 Jesus didn't turn the water into wine. This was Welch's grape juice. Well, let me tell you something, people. I performed weddings for probably, I don't know, probably around 10 years, maybe longer. I have done hundreds of weddings. I did five weddings over a three-day weekend, and I did four weddings in one day. I've done hundreds of weddings. And I don't think anybody... Uh, you know, unless somebody was under 12 years old, they got, if they wanted wine they, at a wedding, they, they drank wine at a wedding. I do not think Jesus turned this into grape juice because, you know, what do they do? You give people the good stuff to drink, and then after they've had a few drinks and they're feeling pretty good, well, then you bring out the rot gut stuff, right? Well, the cheaper stuff, maybe not rot gut, but, you know, the cheaper stuff. 
Because look at what he says. Every man at the beginning does set forth good wine, and, been, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. This beginning of miracles, this beginning of miracles, did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. So, he turned water into wine. Water, like a baptism, right? Wine. What did wine represent? Let's take a look. All right, let's go to Matthew chapter 26. This is the Last Supper. Christ is getting ready to be crucified. And uh, this is just before they go to the garden to be uh, where Jesus is betrayed by Judas Iscariot. Matthew 26, 26. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Now remember, Jesus is the bread of life. You know, sometimes figures of speech. I'm sorry, Jesus is not a loaf of wonder bread. Some of those, some of you remember wonder bread. Verse 27. So he says, take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, drink ye all of it. For this is my blood, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many, not all, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. The blood of the New Testament. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine, what was it? It was wine, people. I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the wine until the day that I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. The wine was representative of the blood of Christ, people. The water was changed into wine. Water into the blood of Christ. In John chapter 6, in verse 54, 55, 56, well, verses 53 through 56. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. All right, verse 57. As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even him, uh, even he shall live by me. This is the bread which came down from heaven. I mean, Christ, where did Christ come from? Heaven, okay? This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. These things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Many, therefore, of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, this is a hard this is an hard saying who can hear it in other words they're saying boy this I, I'm not so sure I understand this you know this is a hard saying when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it he said unto them doth this offend you oh wait a minute you wait a minute hold on here Jesus you want us to be cannibals and vampires eating your flesh and drinking your blood? Is that what you're saying? Well, that's what the 
fleshly, carnal mind would think. And believe it or not, that's in the um, you-know-who's uh, tall mud. Take the word tall, T-A-L-L, -L, and then take the word mud, M-U-D. Take tall and mud and put them together, one word, and then delete one L. And uh, that little thing about being a vampire and cannibal is in that. I'm afraid to say any of these words because of the uh, uh, tube uh, people, if you know what I mean. When Jesus, when Jesus uh, knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Doth this offend you? What and if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? Well, guess what? They did. In the early chapter of the book of Acts, it records where they saw Jesus was taken up into heaven. He was taken up into the clouds. And if we're not taken up into the clouds with him when he returns, it's the wrong Messiah. Period. And they'll probably try to fake a coming of the Messiah. But if we're not taken up in the clouds, you'll know it's the wrong one. But all the people in John Hagee's church, well, he'll be how he'll be proud to proclaim that even Christ has come. Verse 63, it is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The flesh doesn't profit you anything. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. And he said, Therefore said I unto you, that no man can come unto me, except it were given unto him of my Father. Do you know that you can't come to Christ except the Father gives you to him? Maybe John Calvin knew something that uh, the uh, whosoever will churches don't. I love this verse coming up. John chapter 6, verse 66. I know, I've covered this a few times. Well, guess what? When you've done over a thousand Bible lessons, sometimes you cover the same stuff a few times. You know what I'm saying? John 6, 6, 6. John 6, 6, 6. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. <laughs> I, I, you know, everybody, uh, I, I, I honestly, I believe whoever put the Bible into uh, chapters and verses, I uh, honestly, I think that they were led of the Holy Spirit. I, I really do. I mean, you couldn't make this up. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. John 6, 6, 6. Then Jesus said unto the twelve, Will ye also go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. I love Peter. And we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God, Jesus answered them, Have I not chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. All right, let's go to John chapter 19. Jesus has been crucified. Verse 32. Then came the soldiers and brake the legs of the first and of the other which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear 
pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. Now you got a Roman soldier, probably a battle-hardened veteran that had fought many wars. You better believe he knows what a dead person looks like. And he took a spear and pierced his side. And what came out? Blood and water. Oh, let me let you know a little secret here. When somebody is freshly dead, the water in the blood separates. Yeah, it separates. So the water and the, uh, the components of the blood and the water, well, they separate. I mean, that's just how it is. Uh, th that only works for fresh somebody that's fresh, just newly dead. And you better believe if a soldier stuck a spear in your side and they see water and blood come out, they know you're dead, period. Verse 35, And he that saw it bear record, and his record is true, and he knoweth that he saith true that ye might believe. Now there's a little thing that the uh, you-know-whos uh, try to say that, well, Jesus really wasn't dead. And, uh, you know, he had been beaten to a pulp, crucified, and they had a spear stuck in his side. And they said he was in the tomb for three days and three nights, and then he woke up from his coma, and then he, uh, you know, came out of the tomb, and everybody says, oh, he raised up from the dead. Uh, they call that the swoon, swoon theory. Uh, they'll come up with anything to deny that Jesus is the Christ. I mean, it is, it's laughable. Really, it's laughable. And when a, when a battle-hardened soldier takes a spear and sticks it in your side, I mean, you know, he didn't just give him a little tiny pinprick and say, oh, water and blood came out. No, he stuck the spear in his side. Okay? And out came out water and blood. And when water separates from the blood, the person is dead. That's how it works. All right, let's go back to water and blood. Let's go to 1 John chapter 5, verse 1. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. What commandments? The Ten Commandments? Well, I wouldn't argue and say that's wrong, but uh, there's another thing, way to look at it. Well, in Matthew 22 and verse 36, someone asked Jesus what was the most important commandment. Matthew 22, 36, he said, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. On these two commandments hang all the law, and the prophets. Now, remember, God told us to live separate, separated and segregated. And I know that's a terrible, horrible word to the social justice warriors. Oh my God, segregation. Oh, being separated, that's horrible. You know, we need to be all mixed up. 
except for the ones that spout that garbage, live in gated communities where they don't let all the other uh, people that live in Section 8 housing, they don't let them into their uh, gated communities. They don't let them into their uh, special Middle Eastern country. No, they expel them. And hopefully you have enough sense not to live next door to the enemies of God as neighbors, okay? Uh, if you got Satanists and witches, and, and if you live in San Francisco, uh, maybe you should move, okay? Because if you lived in Sodom and Gomorrah, and there wasn't 10 righteous people in the entire city, uh, maybe God will send fire and brimstone and destroy it. So, you know, love thy neighbor. Maybe you should find some good, decent neighbors to live next to. I, that's just my opinion. You know, but what do I know? 1 John chapter 5, verse 2. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. For whosoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. This is he that came by water and blood. This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And that is a good proof verse in, uh, for, for seeing if you've got a, a real Bible or not. If this verse is changed, you'll know you got a fake Bible. Well, no, you don't have a Bible. If that's been changed, you don't have a Bible. You got Satan's commentary on the Bible. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in the earth. There's three that bear witness in the earth, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater, for this is the witness of God, which he hath testified of his Son. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Wow, somebody tell that to John Hagee. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you, that ye believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. Somebody tell that to the uh, charismatic churches. Oh God, give me a ton of gold. Play, play, play a Jesus. Uh, no. Does God want you to have a ton of gold? If he does, he'd give it to you. Verse 15. And if we know that he hear us whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. If any man see his brother sin a sin, which is not unto death, he shall ask and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he pray for it. 
All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. Uh, so there are sins, and then there are gross sins. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that the wicked one toucheth him not. And we know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. Oh, yeah. And we know that the Son of God has come and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God in eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. Now, what would you rather have? The blood of goats and bulls in the Old Testament? And what did they used to do with the blood of the bulls and goats and the sacrifices. They burned them in fire. Or would you rather have the blood of Christ? Personally, I think I'd rather have the blood of Christ, but that's just me. Now, in 2 Corinthians, another one of Paul's writings that they hate, chapter 11 and verse 2, For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Christ does not want a harlot, a whore. And that's what uh, that little country over in the Middle East is right now when it comes to uh, Christ. That's a whore. And they go a whoring after every other false god except for Christ. All right, let's go to Revelation chapter 19, verse 1. And we'll get ready to close this out. And after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments, for he hath judged the great whore. That's right. God wants a virgin, not a Christ wants a virgin, not a whore. Can I get an amen? For he hath judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again they said, Alleluia, for her smoke rose up forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne, saying, Amen. Hallelujah. Now, uh, just for the record, I think the four and twenty elders are the uh, twelve sons of Jacob, Israel, the twelve tribes, and the twelve apostles. And I'm sorry, I don't think it's Judas Iscariot. I think it's Paul. So there. Na 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 na. I know. But uh, the Paul haters can argue with, they can argue with the devil. I won't argue with them. The Bible says a heretic after the first or second admonition, reject. I won't argue with a heretic more than once or twice. Verse 5, And a voice came out of the throne saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come. For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. Wow. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he said unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. 
Now, somebody sent this to me. Some of this, I added a little bit to it, but somebody sent this to me, so I can't take credit for it. But uh, sadly, few, few people seem to really understand the mission of the church. You know, the, the Great Tribulation is to purge us of all the garbage in our lives. You know, that's going to be, will people love their lives on this earth? Or will they give up their lives, if so called, to do so for the, for the faith of Christ? If their heads are on the guillotine chopping block, and they're told, deny Christ and we'll let you live, Will they do so? Will they say, well, I won't deny Christ. Take my head. Will they, you know, do you want the things of this earth? Do you want your TV, your microwave oven, your SUV, your pretty house, your football games, your soap operas? Is that what you want? Or do you want Christ more than anything else in this world? Persecution is going to bring revival to the remnant church. And it's going to be a very small remnant. And it's going to separate the wheat from the tares or the weeds. I mean, Jesus promised us, promised us that we would be hated. In Matthew 10, 22, it says, And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. And what's the name that's hated above all names? Jesus. But he that endureth to the end shall be saved. Somebody send a memo to the pre-tribbers, please. We are warned of tribulation or trouble in this world. Acts 14, 22 confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith that we and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. Paul, you know, the guy that all the Hebrew roots people hate, he warned of, of tribulation, of persecution. In 2 Timothy 3.12, he said, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And here is what somebody sent to me. I'm going to read it word for word, and I quote, Everyone is always searching for the one sign or event that will trigger Christ's return, yet completely ignore the one thing that is the determining factor of when Christ returns. It is not about what king or king or uh, what king it's it is not about what king or kingdom is doing that is the final event it's what the church is like what the church is doing jesus is returning for a bride that has made herself ready a church triumphant his return is not a rescue mission that's right people uh this is bob saying this it's not a rescue mission to save the church from the Great Tribulation. The Great Tribulation is to, to purge the church of all the un, ungodly, worldly stuff out of her, people. So let's go back to reading what this one sent me. Jesus is returning for a bride that has made herself ready, a church triumphant. His return is not a rescue mission. It is a completion of the task he appointed the church to fulfill, and until she does... He will not return. He is coming for a bride that has made herself ready to be received by her husband. Her gown washed white in his blood without spot or wrinkle. The bride is still not ready. The great exploits of the church has not yet occurred because she is still too immature, too busy acting childless, childish. When she matures, then we will see the signs and wonders that take place to bring about the greatest revival in human history. The latter reign is to be greater than the former reign. Unquote. Boy, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't add anything better to that. I'm telling you. That's, poof. Yeah. All right. So let's get ready to close this out. I've got a 
another few more things to say and here we go all right let's go to the book of revelation chapter 21 verse 1 and i saw a new heaven and a new earth why because the old one's polluted it's filth it gets burned up right and i saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea and i john Solva saw the holy city new jerusalem not the old jerusalem the holy city not the unholy whore that's over there now and i john saw the holy city new jerusalem coming down from god out of heaven prepared as a bride adorned for her husband and i heard a great voice out of heaven saying behold the tabernacle of god is with men and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people and god himself shall be with them and be their god and god shall wipe away all tears from their eyes and there shall be no more death neither sorrow nor crying neither shall there be any more pain for the former things are passed away and he that sat upon the throne said behold i make all things new and he said unto me right for these words are true and faithful and he said unto me it is done i am alpha and omega the beginning and the end i will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely he that overcometh shall inherit all things and i will be his god and he shall be my son verse 8 but the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and saucers and by the way people that word saucer in the greek is where they get the word for pharmacy pharmaceutical oh yeah it has reference to drugs and spells and witchcraft saucers in the greek pharmakia that's where you and and when you look at all the names of the drugs a lot of them come from greek the greek language yeah think about that the next time they want to give you um, uh stick something in your arm yeah think about that and saucers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone which is the second death and there came unto me one of the seven angels which had the seven vials full of the last seven plagues and talked with me saying come hither i will show thee the bride the lamb's wife and he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city the holy jerusalem the holy jerusalem descending out of heaven from god having the glory of god and her light was like unto a stone most precious even like a jasper stone clear as crystal and had a great wall and high oh yeah they you know uh, uh our illustrious president talks about building a wall well we're not going to have to build a wall it's that's already got a wall and had a wall great and high and had 12 gates and at the gates 12 angels and the names written with uh, thereon which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of israel uh where's that 13th gentile gate where is that i don't see bill gates name on there either no 12 gates 12 tribes of the children of israel on the east three gates on the north three gates on the south three gates and on the west three gates and the wall of the city had 12 foundations and in them the names of the 12 apostles of the lamb 12 foundations built upon the foundation which is jesus christ didn't we read that earlier yes we did verse 15 and he that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city and the gates thereof and the wall thereof and the city lieth four square and the length is as large as the breadth and he measured the city with the reed twelve thousand 
furlongs. The length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. And he measured the wall thereof, 140 and four cubits. That is one heck of a wall, people. That's like 75 meters high. And he measured the wall thereof, 140 and four cubits. According to the measure of a man, that is of the angel. That's about 75 yards, people. That's, that's a big wall. And the building of the wall of it was jasper, and the city was pure gold like unto clear glass. And the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. Now, if you take a look at the stones that were on the breastplate of the high priest, it had 12 stones, you will find a lot of similarities to this. That's if you bothered to read the, uh, I think it's in the book of, Leviticus. I'm not 100% sure. It's been a while since I've read it. Um, I'm not, I don't believe I'm a Levitical priest uh, or of that tribe. I don't think so, but you know. Uh, but it's been a while since I've read Leviticus. It's been a while, but I think it's in there. But, uh, the breastplate, the high priest breastplate. You can read about that. And the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth an emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth a chrysophilus, chrysop I don't know, the eleventh a jath, jath, j jacinth, the twelfth an amethyst. Every one of those stones has reference to one of the tribes. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Every several gate was of one pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold, as it were, transparent glass. Remember the parable of the pearl of great price? Think about that when you're thinking about the gates that were made of twelve pearls. The, guy, uh, the one that sold everything that he had to buy the, the, the pearl of great price? Yeah. I hope you've read the Bible, and you know what I'm talking about, I hope. If you haven't, please go to Genesis 1-1. Start reading. Do you know that if you read three chapters every day, that you will have read the entire Bible in one year? All you got to do is read three chapters a day. What is that, 15 minutes? 15 minutes a day. Uh, maybe 20, I don't know. Some chapters are longer than others, you know. But, uh, all right, verse 22, and I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. John eight twelve, right? And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it, and the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there, and they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it, and there shall no wise into, into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they that are written in the Lamb's book of life, the bride people, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. That's right. Amen. The, the Lamb. The, the bride. All right. I guess this is it. I'm going to close this series out. This is the part three, the end of the Bride of Christ. I hope you enjoyed this lesson. I actually enjoyed this lesson. I thought it was pretty good. Um, uh, all the the way everything ties in. I mean, it's not to my glory, it's to his glory. You know, I've had people ask me to do uh, my testimony. I've never felt, my story is not important. What is important is Christ, his story. And that's what history is. His story. History. His story. Because the Lord, the Lord raises up kings, the Lord puts kings down. 
And that's why the Lord is going to allow the devil and his children to rule for a time and purge his, his bride, his church, of everything evil and wicked of this world and, and, and see, are you, gonna, are you willing to give up everything you have in this world, including your life, for Christ? That's the kind of bride that the Lord wants. He wants a bride, a virgin, without spot or blemish. He doesn't want the whore. And sadly, most places, buildings of what they call worship, that's what they are. They're whores, led by whores. I'm ashamed to even call them a church. So, all right, well, this is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to God the Father and His only begotten Son, Jesus, who is the Christ, the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to Him and Him alone. In Jesus' precious name, amen.